Hebrews 11, verse 22. By faith, Joseph, when his end was near, spoke about the exodus of the Israelites from Egypt and gave instructions concerning the burial of his bones. Let's read it. Genesis 50, verse 22. Joseph stayed in Egypt along with his father's family. He lived 110 years and saw the third generation of Ephraim's children. Also, the children of Machir, son of Manasseh, were placed at birth on Joseph's knees. Then Joseph said to his brothers, I am about to die, but God will surely come to your aid and take you up out of this land to the land he promised on oath to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So he's prophesying about this. He says, I am about to die, but God will surely come to your aid and take you up out of this land to the land he promised on oath to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And Joseph made the Israelites swear an oath and said, God will surely come to your aid, and then you must carry my bones up from this place. So that's faith. He's now obviously not living to see that. He's letting them know ahead of time, this is going to happen. God is going to do this. So Joseph died at the age of 110, and after they embalmed him, he was placed in a coffin in Egypt. Now let's go to Exodus 13, verse 17. When Pharaoh let the people go, God did not lead them on the road through the Philistine country, though that was shorter. For God said if they faced war, they might change their minds and return to Egypt. So God led the people around by the desert road toward the Red Sea. The Israelites went up out of Egypt, ready for a battle. Moses took the bones of Joseph with him because Joseph had made the Israelites swear an oath. He had said, God will surely come to your aid, and then you must carry my bones up with you from this place. After leaving Sakoth, they camped at Etham on the edge of the desert. By day, the Lord went ahead of them in a pillar of cloud to guide them on their way, and by night, in a pillar of fire to give them light so that they could travel by day or, no or night. Neither the pillar of cloud by day nor the pillar of fire by night left its place in front of the people. So same language being used by Moses. Moses takes the bones of Joseph with him because Joseph had made the Israelites swear on oath. He had said, God will surely come to your aid and then you must carry my bones up with you from this place. Joseph knew that that was going to happen and that he would be buried in the land of Canaan with his fathers. Hebrews 11, verse 23. By faith, Moses' parents hid him for three months after he was born because they saw he was no ordinary child and that they were not afraid of the king's edict. Let's read it. Exodus 2. Now a man of the tribe of Levi married a Levite woman, and she became pregnant and gave birth to a son. When she saw that, she was, that he was a fine child, she hid him for three months. But when she could hide him no longer, she got a papyrus basket for him and coated it with tar and pitch. Then she placed the child in it and put it among the, the reeds along the bank of the Nile. His sister stood at a distance to see what would happen to him. Then Pharaoh's daughter went down from the Nile to bathe, and her attendants were walking along the river bank. She saw the basket among the reeds and sent her female slave to get it. She opened it and saw the baby. He was crying, and she felt sorry for him. This is one of the Hebrew babies, she said. Then his sister asked Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and get one of the Hebrew women to nurse the baby for you? Yes, go, she answered. So the girl went and got the baby's mother. Pharaoh's daughter. <laughs> I never realized that actually that Moses' mother was able to nurse him. I didn't realize this until my daughter pointed it out to me. And, you know, everything in her world is really about having this baby and nursing this baby and, you know, everything that she does with this, with my grandson. So it's so much more meaningful because nursing your baby is a big deal. Like that's such a, it's such a precious time of bonding that you just don't get back. And it's such a foundation to that connection between mother and child. And one of the things Tori said was how good God is that he gave that to Moses and his mom. I'm just never going to read this story the same. Yes, go, she answered. So the girl went and got the baby's mother. Pharaoh's daughter said to her, take this baby and nurse him for me and I will pay you. So the woman took the baby and nursed him. When the child grew older, she took him to Pharaoh's daughter and he became her son. She named him Moses, saying, I drew him out of the water. So there was the faith of the parents of Moses. And what a beautiful way that God blessed the faith of Moses' mother, that he still gave them that connection and that contact with one another. That's so special. And back to Hebrews 11, verse 24, by faith, Moses, when he had grown up, 
refused to be known as the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He chose to be mistreated along with the people of God, rather to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. He regarded disgrace for the sake of Christ as of greater value than the treasures of Egypt, because he was looking ahead to his reward. By faith, he left Egypt, not fearing the king's anger. He persevered because he saw him who was invisible. By faith, he kept the Passover and the application of blood, so that the destroyer of the firstborn would not touch the firstborn of Israel. And by faith, the people passed through the Red Sea as on dry land. But when the Egyptians tried to do so, they were drowned. All right, this is working up to be a long video, but I don't mind it because those are some awesome faith stories. So let's do it. Back to Exodus 2, verse 11. One day after Moses had grown up, he went out to where his own people were and watched them at their hard labor. He saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his own people, looking his way and, and that, and seeing no one, he killed the Egyptian and hid him in the sand. The next day he went out and saw two Hebrews fighting. He asked the one in the wrong, why are you hitting your fellow Hebrew? The man said, who made you ruler and judge over us? Are you going, thinking of killing me as you did the Egyptian? Then Moses was afraid and thought, what I did must have become known. When Pharaoh heard of this, he tried to kill Moses. But Moses fled from Pharaoh and went to live in Midian, where he sat down by a well. Now a priest of Midian had seven daughters, and they came to draw water and fill the troughs to what? to water their father's flock. Some shepherds came along and drove them away, but Moses got up and came to their rescue and watered their flock. When the girls returned to Ruel, their father, he asked them, why have you returned so early today? They answered, an Egyptian rescued us from the shepherds. He even drew water for us and watered the flock. And where is he? Ruel asked his daughters. Why did you leave him? Invite him to have something to eat. Moses agreed to stay with the man who gave his daughter Zipporah to Moses in marriage. Zipporah gave birth to a son, and Moses named him Gershom, saying, I have become a foreigner in a foreign land. During that long period, the king of Egypt died. The Israelites groaned in their slavery and cried out, and their cry for help because of their slavery went up to God. God heard their groaning, and he remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. So God looked on the Israelites and was concerned about them. Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the far side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire from within a bush. Moses saw that though the bush was on fire, it did not burn up. So Moses thought, I will go over and see this strange sight, why the bush does not burn up. When the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, God called to him from within the bush, Moses, Moses. And Moses said, here I am. Do not come any closer, God said. Take off your sandals, for the place you, where you are standing is holy ground. Then he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. At this, Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. The Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I have heard them crying out because of their slave drivers, and I am concerned about their suffering. So I have come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of the land into a good and spacious land. A land flowing with milk and honey, the home of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites. And now the cry of the Israelites has reached me, and I have seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them. So now go, I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? And God said, I will be with you, and this will be a sign to you that it is I who have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God on this mountain. Moses said to God, suppose I go to the Israelites and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they ask me, what is his name? Then what shall I tell them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. There's a footnote right there. And it says, or I will be what I will be. And it's not or, because if the translators had understood the rest of the word of God, they would know that God says, I was, I am, and I will be. And that he stated his name right here, if you look in Strong's, as Hayah, which is a verb, it is moving. It is continuing. He was, he is, he is to come, he is being revealed. This is what you are to say to the Israelites, I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, say to the Israelites, the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever. The name you shall call me from generation to generation. Okay, not Yahweh, Hayah. The thing you need to know about that is that Reformed Judaism changed 
God's name from a verb, which is active and moving and living and breathing to a proper noun, right? Because, you know, God has to go by our rules, not us rending our hearts to God. He has to go by our rules. How does that work, guys? Doesn't work. He was, he is, he is to come. He is being revealed. He is the beginning and the end, the alpha and the omega. We don't get to limit God by our human rules, do we? Yahweh just means, just means God, apparently, from what I understand. It just means God. Same thing as calling God Allah, because Allah in Arabic just means God. No, it's not a false God. It is, just means God. If someone said God or Jesus in uh, Spanish or Chinese or Italian, would we say that was a false God? No, we wouldn't say that was a false God. Allah just means God in Arabic. Yahweh just means God. It's not the name of God. It just means God. Go, assemble the elders of Israel and say to them, The Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, appeared to me and said, I have watched over you and have seen what has been done to you in Egypt. And I have promised to bring you up out of your misery in Egypt into the land of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites, a land flowing with milk and honey. The elders of Israel will listen to you. Then you and the elders are to go to the king of Egypt and say to him, the Lord, the God of the Hebrews, has met with us. Let us take a three-day journey into the wilderness to offer sacrifices to the Lord our God. But I know that the king of Egypt will not let you go unless a mighty hand compels him. So I will stretch out my hand and strike the Egyptians with all the wonders that I will perform among them. So God's telling him ahead of time. After that, he will let you go. Okay, so he's telling him ahead of time. These are the things that are going to happen. And I will make the Egyptians favorably disposed toward this people so that when you leave... You will not go empty-handed. Every woman is to ask her neighbor and any woman living in her house for articles of silver and gold and for clothing, which you will put on your sons and daughters, and so you will plunder the Egyptians. And that is exactly what happened that night of Passover is they plundered the Egyptians. God made the Egyptians favorably disposed to the Israelites, and they plundered the Egyptians. Moses answered, what if they do not believe me or listen to me and say the Lord did not appear to you? Then the Lord said to him, what is that in your hand? A staff, he replied. The Lord said, throw it on the ground. Moses threw it on the ground and it became a snake and he ran from it. Then the Lord said to him, reach out your hand and take it by the tail. So Moses reached out and took hold of the snake and it turned back into a staff in his hand. This said the Lord is so that they may believe that the Lord, the God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob had appe has appeared to you. Then the Lord said, put your hand inside your cloak. So Moses put his hand in his cloak and when he took it out, the skin was leprous. It had become white as snow. Now put it back into your cloak, he said. So Moses put his hand back into his cloak, and when he took it out, it was restored like the rest of his flesh. Then the Lord said, if they do not believe you or pay attention to the first sign, they may believe the second. But if they do not believe these two signs or listen to you, take some water from the Nile and pour it on the dry ground. The water you take from the river will become blood on the ground. Moses said to the Lord, pardon your servant, Lord. I have never been so eloquent, neither in the past, nor since you have spoken to your servant. I am slow of speech and tongue. The Lord said to him, who gave human beings their mouths? Who makes them deaf or mute? Who gives them sight or makes them blind? Is it not I, the Lord? Now go, I will help you speak and will teach you what to say. But Moses said, pardon your servant, Lord, please send someone else. Then the Lord's anger burned against Moses and he said, what about your brother Aaron the Levite? I know he can speak well. He is already on his way to meet you and he will be glad to see you. You shall speak with him to him and put words in his mouth. I will help both of you to speak and will teach you what to do. He will speak to the people for you, and it will be as if he were your mouth and as if you were God to him. But take this staff in your hand so you can perform the signs with it. Then Moses went back to Jethro, his father-in-law, and said to him, Let me return to my own people in Egypt to see if any of them are still alive. Jethro said, Go, and I wish you well. Now the Lord had said to Moses in Midian, Go back to Egypt, for all those who wanted to kill you are dead. So Moses took his wife and sons, put them on a donkey, and started back to Egypt. And he took the staff of God in his hand. Then the Lord said to Moses, when you return to Egypt, see that you perform before Pharaoh all the wonders I have given you the power to do, but I will harden his heart so that he will not let the people go. Then say to Pharaoh, this is what the Lord says. Israel is my firstborn son. And I told you, let my son go so he may worship me, but you refuse to let him go. So I will kill your firstborn son at a lodging place on the way. The Lord met Moses and was about to kill him. But Zipporah took a flint knife, cut off her son's foreskin, and touched Moses' feet with it. Surely you are a bridegroom of blood to me, she said. So the Lord let him alone. And at that time, she said bridegroom of blood, referring to circumcision. 
The Lord said to Aaron, go into the wilderness to meet Moses. So he met Moses at the mountain of God and kissed him. Then Moses told Aaron everything the Lord had sent, sent him to say, and also about all the signs he had com commanded him to perform. Moses and Aaron brought together all the elders of the Israelites, and Aaron told them everything the Lord had said to Moses. He also performed the signs before the people, and they believed. And when they heard that the Lord was concerned about them and had seen their misery, they bowed down in worship. Afterward, Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh and said, This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. Let my people go so that they may hold a festival to me in the wilderness. Pharaoh said, Who is the Lord that I should obey him and let Israel go? I don't know the Lord, and I will not let Israel go. Then they said, The God of the Hebrews has met with us. Now let us take a three-day journey into the wilderness to offer sacrifices to the Lord our God, or he may strike us with plagues or with the sword. But the king of Egypt said, Moses and Aaron, why are you taking the people away from their labor? Get back to your work. Then Pharaoh said, look, the people of the land are now numerous, and you are stopping them from working. The same day, Pharaoh gave this order to the slave drivers and overseers in charge of the people. You are no longer to supply the people with straw for making bricks. Let them go and gather their own straw, but require them to make the same number of bricks as before. Don't reduce the quota. They are lazy. That is why they are crying out. Let us go and sacrifice to our God. Make the work harder for the people so they can keep working and pay no attention to lies. Then the slave drivers and the overseers went out and said to the people, this is what, the Pharaoh, what Pharaoh says. I will not give you any more straw. Go and get your own straw wherever you can find it, but your work will not be reduced at all. So the people scattered all over Egypt to gather stubble to use for straw. I just want to ask you something right here. Does God know what, what Pharaoh's going to do? Like, has he not put this on the heart of Pharaoh? Or is this Pharaoh's own idea that he's like fighting against God with? God's doing something. He's doing something. So when these things happen to you, you need to ask him. You need to go to him and ask him what he's doing and what does he require of you? Does God not know the situation I'm in right now? He's doing something. Nothing is happening without God's knowledge and nothing is an equal power to God or catches him by surprise, you have to know that he is sovereign, that he knows everything, and then you just got to get into position. Okay, Lord, like you know everything. You have every ability to change everything. What are you, what are you doing with me right now? Help me to receive it. That's it. Just become his offering. The slave drivers kept pressing them, saying, complete the work required of you for each day, just as when you had straw. And Pharaoh's slave drivers beat the Israelite overseers they had appointed, demanding, why haven't you met your quota of bricks yesterday or today or as before? Then the Israelite overseers went and appealed to Pharaoh. Why have you treated your servants this way? Your servants are given no straw, yet we are told make bricks. Your servants are being beaten, but the fault is with your own people. Pharaoh said, lazy, that's what you are, lazy. That is why you keep saying, let us go and sacrifice to the Lord. Now get to work. You will not be given any straw, yet you must produce your full quota of bricks. The Israelite overseers realized they were in trouble when they were told, you are not to reduce the number of bricks required of you for each day. When they left Pharaoh, they found Moses and Aaron waiting to meet them. And they said, may the Lord look on you and judge you. You have made us obnoxious to Pharaoh and his officials and have put a sword into their hand to kill us. Now, why is God bringing trouble on Moses? Isn't, aren't Moses and Aaron his servants? Why is he bringing trouble on them? What is he doing here? Why is he bringing the uh, Israelites lower? He could have just, you know, changed Pharaoh's heart and let, you know, let him drive, uh, drive the Israelites out of Egypt and closed up the sea. Why is he doing all of this stuff? Because he's revealing his glory. And you know what? You don't know God's glory. Like you don't notice his glory. You don't acknowledge his glory until he's brought you in a particular position, right? Is God just bringing grief on me willingly? Is he just doing that? Like it, does it just please him to bring trouble on me? Does it please him to bring trouble on you? You know, in the assembly, we talked about uh, people who originally, like, you did the first fast, but they were fasting for themselves. They weren't really getting, like, hey, there's a purpose in what God's doing here. He's directing your attention to something. And you were corrected, and you felt bad about it, and then you got a little bit lower, and you got a bit, little bit more into it, and started to realize, okay, this is what he's teaching us in this. I need to be looking at what he's teaching my own heart in this situation. It's not that we're fasting because we have any power in and of ourselves in this fast or because we're manipulating God into something. It's there's something that he's teaching us. He's bringing us into position. That's what he's doing here with the Israelites. 
And there's good reason why the Israelites end up hardened, why it is that some of them like didn't believe and they're grumbling against Moses and Aaron. God's demonstrating something to us. Like he's showing us something in this story that even with all of everything he does to bring them low and get their attention and show them this is a really bad situation that you're in that I delivered you from. Are you going to believe in me? Like, are you going to continue to remind yourself of who I am and the name that I made for myself? Or are you going to reduce that name to a word? right? Hello? People do it all the time. In the name of Jesus. Do they not do that? Is that his name? No. The name is the name he made for himself. The name is what he's doing, who he was, who he is, who he is being revealed to be. He has a purpose in everything and we have to look for that purpose. So what are they doing? They turn against Moses and Aaron and they say, may the Lord look on you and judge you. You've made us obnoxious to Pharaoh and his officials and have put a sword in their hand to kill us. Moses returned to the Lord and said, why, Lord, have you brought trouble on this people? Is this why you sent me? Ever since I went to Pharaoh to speak your name, he has brought trouble on this people and you have not rescued your people at all. Then the Lord said to Moses, now you will see what I will do to Pharaoh because of my mighty hand. He will let them go because of my mighty hand. He will drive them out of this country. Okay, but he didn't do it right away. It took a lot. Why was God dragging this out? Why was he doing that? He's dragging it out to demonstrate something. God also said to Moses, I am the Lord. I appeared to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob as God Almighty. But by my name, the Lord, I did not make myself fully known to them. I established my covenant with them to give them the land of Canaan where they resided as foreigners. Moreover, I have heard the groaning of the Israelites whom the Egyptians are enslaving, and I have remembered my covenant. That's so interesting that he says this. Okay, I appeared to Abraham, to Isaac, and Jacob as God Almighty, but by my name, the Lord. Okay, so... In Hebrew, God Almighty is El Shaddai, but by my name, the Lord, I did not make myself fully known to them. Okay, but what is the name that he gave them? He gave them the name Hayah. This is a different name that he's revealing. This is what you don't get when you go off of the, uh, the authority of the world and you're saying, oh, I know Hebrew, so therefore I'm so smart and I know how to interpret the Bible better than you. That's stupid. The Pharisees and the Sadducees knew Hebrew. And they couldn't even recognize Christ. Do you hear what he's saying? By that name, I didn't fully reveal myself to them. But by this name, I will. I was, I am, I am being revealed. His name is a verb. Therefore say to the Israelites, I am the Lord and I will bring you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians. I will free you from being slaves to them and I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with mighty acts of judgment. I will take you as my own people and I will be your God. Then you will know that I am the Lord your God, who brought you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians, and I will bring you to the land I swore with uplifted hand to give Abraham to Isaac and to Jacob. I will give it to you as a possession. I am the Lord. Moses reported this to the Israelites, but they did not listen to him because of their discouragement and harsh labor. Then the Lord said to Moses, go, tell tell Pharaoh, king of Egypt, to let the Israelites go out of his country. I just want to take a quick moment. I want to go back to I am. I want to go to Blue Letter Bible, in, or you can look up Strong's, and it is the word Haya, and it is the word Strong's H1961. And it says to be, become, come to pass, exist, happen, fall out. To happen, fall out, occur, take place, come about, come to pass, come into being, become, to arise, appear, come, to become, be instituted, be established, to abide, remain, continue, to stand, lie, be in, be at, be situated, to accompany, be with, to occur, come to pass, be done, be brought about, be finished. This is the language he uses, isn't it? I was, I am, I will be. I'm being revealed. His kingdom, his cause, his reason, what he's doing is being established, is being instituted, and it's all part of his name. He's the beginning and the end. He's the Alpha and the Omega. Do you see like how that bodes better with the name that God has chosen for himself, that we're to call him, that we're supposed to call him forever versus a proper noun? Which one is more of the heart of God? I don't know why anyone would even need to argue this, except that they're concerned about their own glory. It's ridiculous. This is very clear. God's name is living. Back to verse six. Therefore say to the Israelites, I am the Lord and I will bring you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians. I will free you from being slaves to them, and I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with mighty acts of judgment. 
I will take you as my own people and I will be your God. Then you will know that I am the Lord your God who brought you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians. And I will bring you to the land I swore with uplifted hand to give to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. I will give it to you as a possession. I am the Lord. Okay, so here's a promise. And I, I just, you know, as I'm reading this, I'm trying to like understand how all of this relates to what he's doing with me right now. And you should be, you know, thinking about how does it relate with you? Or you can think about what he's doing with me right now too. You know, it appears that Moses is kind of concerned, right? Like here God's talking to him, but he's kind of concerned about like, well, how are they going to believe me? How are they going to know that it's you? Well, because I'm going to testify to it. I'm going to show signs. These are the same questions I've asked God as well. But see, at this point, we have the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit testifies to what I'm doing. If he wants to show signs, he can show signs, and he has. He did it with Jeremiah's birth. He's doing it right now. So keep watch. Keep watch on the signs. Keep watch on the things that I'm telling you. God has said this is going to happen. And when it does, then you will know. Verse 9, Moses reported to the Israelites, but they did not listen to him because of their discouragement and harsh labor. Then the Lord said to Moses, go tell Pharaoh, king of Egypt, to let the Israelites go out of this country. But Moses said to the Lord, if the Israelites will not listen to me, why would Pharaoh listen to me? since I speak with faltering lips. Now the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron about the Israelites and Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and he commanded them to bring the Israelites out of Egypt. These were the heads of the families. I'm going to skip all that. It's quite long. I'm going to go to verse 26. It was this Aaron and Moses to whom the Lord said, bring the Israelites out of Egypt by their divisions. They are the ones who spoke to Pharaoh, king of Egypt, about bringing the Israelites out of Egypt, this same Moses and Aaron. Now, when the Lord spoke to Moses in Egypt, he said to him, I am the Lord. Tell Pharaoh, king of Egypt, everything I tell you. But Moses said to the Lord, since I speak with faltering lips, why would Pharaoh listen to me? Then the Lord said to Moses, see, I have made you like God to Pharaoh and your brother Aaron will be your prophet. You are to say everything I command you and your brother Aaron is to tell Pharaoh to let the Israelites go out of this country. But I will harden Pharaoh's heart. And though I multiply my signs and wonders in Egypt, he will not listen to you. Then I will lay my hand on Egypt, and with mighty acts of judgment, I will bring out my divisions, my people, the Israelites. And the Egyptians will know that I am the Lord when I stretch out my hand against Egypt and bring out the Israelites out of it. Moses and Aaron did just as the Lord commanded them. Moses was 80 years old and Aaron 83 when they spoke to Pharaoh. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron, when Pharaoh says to you, perform a miracle, then say to Aaron, take your staff and throw it down before Pharaoh and it will become like a snake. It will become a snake. So Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh and did just as the Lord commanded. Aaron threw his staff down in front of Pharaoh and his officials, and it became a snake. Pharaoh then summoned wise men and sorcerers, and the Egyptian magicians also did the same things by their secret arts. Each one threw down his his staff, and it became a snake. But Aaron's staff swallowed up their staffs. Yet Pharaoh's heart became hard, and he would not listen to them just as the Lord said. Then the Lord said to Moses, Pharaoh's heart is unyielding. He refuses to let the people go. Go to Pharaoh in the morning as he goes out to the river. Confront him on the bank of the Nile and take in your hand the staff that was changed into a snake. Then say to him, the Lord, the God of the, he- of the Hebrews has sent me to say to you, let my people go so they may worship me in the wilderness. But until now you have not listened. This is what the Lord says. By this you will know that I am the Lord. With the staff that is in my hand, I will strike the water of the Nile and it will be changed to blood. The fish in the Nile will die and the river will stink. The Egyptians will not be able to drink its water. The Lord said to Moses, tell Aaron, take your staff and stretch out your hand over the waters of Egypt, over the streams and canals, over the ponds and all the reservoirs, and they will turn to blood. Blood will be everywhere in Egypt, even in the vessels of wood and stone. Moses and Aaron did just as the Lord commanded. He raised his staff in the presence of Pharaoh and his officials and struck the water of the Nile. And all the water was changed to blood. The fish in the Nile died, and the river smelled so bad that the Egyptians could not drink its water. Blood was everywhere in Egypt. But the Egyptian magicians did the same things by their secret arts, and Pharaoh's heart became hard. He would not listen to Moses and Aaron, just as the Lord said. Instead, he turned and went into his palace and did not, did not take even this into his heart. And all the Egyptians dug out the Nile to get drinking water because they could not drink the water of the river. Seven days passed after the Lord struck the Nile. Then the Lord said to Moses, go to Pharaoh and say to him, this is what the Lord says. Let my people go so that they may worship me. If you refuse to let them go, I will send a plague of frogs on your whole country. The Nile will teem with frogs. 
They will come up into your palace and your bedroom and onto your bed, into the houses of your officials and on your people and into your ovens and kneading troughs. The frogs will come up on you and your people and all your officials. Then the Lord said to Moses, tell Aaron, stretch out your hand with your staff over the streams and canals and ponds and make frogs come up on the land of Egypt. Pharaoh summoned Moses and Aaron and said, pray to the Lord to take the frogs away from me and my people and I will let your people go to offer sacrifices to the Lord. Moses said to Pharaoh, I leave to you the honor of setting the time for me to pray for you and your officials and your people that you and your house may be rid of frogs except for those that remain in the Nile. Tomorrow, Pharaoh said, Moses replied, it will be as you say, so that you may know that there is no one like the Lord our God. The frogs will leave you and your houses, your officials and your people. They will remain only in the Nile. After Moses and Aaron left, Aaron left Pharaoh, Moses cried out to the Lord about the frogs he had brought on Pharaoh, and the Lord did what Moses asked. The frogs died in the houses, in the courtyards, and in the fields. They were piled into heaps, and the land reeked of them. But when Pharaoh saw that there was relief, he hardened his heart and would not listen to Moses and Aaron, just Aaron, <laughs> Pharaoh and Aaron, uh, Moses and Aaron, just as the Lord had said. Then the Lord said to Moses, tell Aaron, stretch out your staff and strike the dust of the ground. And throughout the land of Egypt, the dust will become gnats. They did this. And when Aaron stretched out his hand with the staff and struck the dust of the ground, gnats came on people and animals. All the dust throughout the land of Egypt became gnats. But when the magicians tried to produce gnats by their secret arts, they could not. Since the gnats were on people and animals everywhere, the magicians said to Pharaoh, this is the finger of God. But Pharaoh's heart was hard. And he would not listen, just as the Lord had said. Then the Lord said to Moses, get up early in the morning and confront Pharaoh as he goes to the river and say to him, this is what the Lord says. Let my people go so that they may worship me. If you do not let my people go, I will send swarms of flies on you and your officials, on your people and into your houses. The houses of the Egyptians will be full of flies. Even the ground will be covered with them. But on that day, I will deal differently with the land of Goshen, where my, where my people live. No swarms of flies will be there so that you will know that I, the Lord, am in this land. I will make a distinction between my people and your people. The sign will occur tomorrow. And the Lord did this. Dense swarms of flies poured into Pharaoh's palace and into the houses of his officials throughout Egypt. The land was ruined by the flies. Then Pharaoh summoned Moses and Aaron and said, go sacrifice to your God here in the land. But Moses said that would not be right. The fact the sacrifices we offer to the Lord, our God, would be detestable to the Egyptians. And if we offer sacrifices that are detestable in their eyes, will they not stone us? We must take a three-day journey into the wilderness to offer sacrifices to the Lord, our God, as he commands. Pharaoh said, I will let you go to offer sacrifices to the Lord, your God, in the wilderness, but you must not go very far. Now pray for me. Moses answered, as soon as I leave you, I will pray to the Lord, and tomorrow the flies will leave Pharaoh and his officials and his people. Only let Pharaoh be sure that he does not act deceitfully again by not letting the people go to offer sacrifices to the Lord. Then Moses left Pharaoh and prayed to the Lord, and the Lord did what Moses asked. The flies left Pharaoh and his officials and his people. Not a fly remained. But this time also Pharaoh hardened his heart and would not let the people go. Then the Lord said to Moses, Go to Pharaoh and say to him, This is what the Lord, the God of the Hebrews, says. Let my people go so that they may worship me. If you refuse to let them go and continue to hold them back, the hand of the Lord will bring a terrible plague on your livestock in the field, on your horses, donkeys, and camels, and on your cattle, sheep, and goats. But the Lord will make a distinction between the livestock of Israel and that of Egypt so that no animal belonging to the Israelites will die. The Lord set a time and said, Tomorrow the Lord will do this in the land. And the next day the Lord did it. All the livestock of the Egyptians died, but not one animal belonging to the Israelites died. Pharaoh investigated and found that not even one of the animals of the Israelites had died, yet his heart was unyielding, and he would not let the people go. Then the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, take handfuls of soot from a furnace and have Moses toss it into the air in the presence of Pharaoh. It will become fine dust all over the land of Egypt, and festering boils will break out on people and animals throughout the land. So they took soot from a furnace and stood before Pharaoh. Moses tossed it into the air, and festering boils broke out on people and animals. The magicians could not stand before Moses because of the boils that were on them and on all the Egyptians. But the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart, and he would not listen to Moses and Aaron, just as the Lord had said to Moses. Then the Lord said to Moses, get up early in the morning, confront Pharaoh and say to him, this is what the Lord, the God of the Hebrews says. 
Let my people go so that they may worship me, or this time I will send the full force of my plagues against you and against your officials and your people so that you may know that there is no one like me in all the earth. I'm just thinking right now, like, how many times God has, like, had to bring us to bottoms and uh, for us to say, mercy, mercy. But, uh, you know, because I'm thinking, my goodness, Pharaoh is so foolish. But then again, I have to look at myself and think, how many places did he have to bring me for me to go, oh, thank God he's done with it, and then go on about my business? Ay, for by now, I could have stretched out my hand and struck you and your people with a plague that would have wiped you off the earth. But I have raised you up for this very purpose that I might show you my power and that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. You still set yourself against my people and will not let them go. Therefore, at this time tomorrow, I will send the worst hailstorm that has ever, ever fallen on Egypt from the day it was founded till now. Give an order now to bring your livestock and everything you have in the field to a place of shelter because the hail will fall on every person and animal that has not been brought out, brought in and is still out in the field and they will die. Um, I just want to point your attention to this very uh, verse, verse 16, where he says, but I have raised you up for this very purpose that I might show you my power and that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. He knows exactly what he's doing. There is no surprise to God. This is his plan. And this is a, an object of his wrath. And what does he tell us? What did Paul tell us about uh, why God raises objects of his wrath? In order to display to the objects of his mercy, God's glory. Everyone's been destined for a purpose. So whatever fruit you're bearing, that's what's going to tell you your purpose. So you better make sure you bear that good fruit until the very end, because only those who bear that good fruit until the very end are the ones who are going to be saved. These officials of Pharaoh who feared the word of the Lord hurried to bring their slaves and their livestock inside. But those who ignored the word of the Lord left their slaves and their livestock in the field. Why in the world would they do that? <laughs> then the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand toward the sky so that hail will fall all over Egypt on people and animals and on everything growing in the fields of Egypt. When Moses stretched out his staff towards the sky, the Lord sent thunder and hail and lightning flashed down to the ground. So the Lord rained hail on the land of Egypt. Hail fell and lightning flashed back and forth. It was the worst storm in all the land of Egypt since it had become a nation. Throughout Egypt, hail struck everything in the fields, both people and animals. It beat down everything growing in the fields and stripped every tree. The only place it did not hail was in the land of Goshen where the Israelites were. Then Pharaoh summoned Moses and Aaron. This time I have sinned, he said to them. Wow, this time, all right. The Lord is in the right. Okay, only took a little while. And I and my people are in the wrong. Pray to the Lord for we have had enough thunder and hail. I will let you go. You don't have to stay any longer. Moses replied, when I have gone out of the city, I will spread out my hands in prayer to the Lord. The thunder will stop and there will be no more hail so that you will know that the earth is the Lord's. But I know that you and your officials still do not fear the Lord God. The flax and barley were destroyed since the barley had headed, had headed and the flax was in bloom. The wheat and spelt, however, were not destroyed because they ripened later. Then Moses left Pharaoh and went out of the city. He spread out his hands toward the Lord. The thunder and hail stopped and the rain no longer poured down on the land. When Pharaoh saw that the rain and hail and thunder had stopped, he sinned again. He and his officials hardened their hearts. So Pharaoh's heart was hard and he would not let the Israelites go, just as the Lord had said through Moses. Then the Lord said to Moses, go to Pharaoh, for I have hardened his heart and the hearts of his officials, so that I may perform these signs of mine among them, that you may tell your children and grandchildren how I dealt harshly with the Egyptians and how I performed my signs among them, and that you may know that I am the Lord. So Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh and said to him, this is what the Lord, the God of the Hebrews says, how long will you refuse to humble yourselves, be, yourself before me? Let my people go so that they may worship me. If you refuse to let them go, I will bring locusts into your country tomorrow. They will cover the face of the ground so that it cannot be seen. They will devour what little you have left after the hail, including every tree that is growing in your fields. They will fill your houses and those of your officials and all the Egyptians, something neither your parents nor your ancestors have ever seen from the day they settled in this land till now. Then Moses turned and left Pharaoh. Pharaoh's officials said to him, how long will this man be a snare to us? Let the people go so that they may worship the Lord their God. Do you not realize that Egypt is ruined? Then Moses and Aaron were brought back to Pharaoh. Go worship the Lord your God, he said, but tell me 
Who will be going? Moses answered, we will go with our young and our old, with our sons and daughters, and with our flocks and herds, because we are to celebrate a festival to the Lord. Pharaoh said, the Lord be with you. If, <laughs> if I let you go along with your women and children, clearly you are bent on evil. No, have only the men go and worship the Lord, since that's what you have been asking for. Then Moses and Aaron were driven out of Pharaoh's presence. You see how Moses or how Pharaoh just turned it around and said, oh, you're bent on evil. You're the one. You're the one bent on evil. Oh, goodness. That is a typical scheme of the devil. And the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand over Egypt so that locusts swarm over the land and devour everything growing in the fields, everything left by the hail. So Moses stretched out his staff over Egypt and the Lord made an east wind blow across the land all that day and all that night. By morning, the wind had brought the locusts. They invaded all Egypt and settled down in every area of the country in great numbers. Okay, so think about that for a minute. Like all night, all day and night, the wind is blowing and then the locusts come. Like, you know, you see how we would look at something like that and we'd be like, oh my goodness, the wind brought it. You know, like that's what would be the narrative on the news. The wind brought it. It was those Santa Anas. They brought the locusts, <laughs> right? Some, some story about how Santa Anas tend to bring locusts. It's global warming. It's global warming. Never have they brought, have the Santa Anas brought locusts before, but all of a sudden they are. It has nothing to do with God. Never before had there been such a plague of locusts, nor will there ever be again. They covered all the ground until it was black. They devoured all that was left after the hail, everything growing in the fields and on the fruit trees. Nothing green remained on a tree or plant in all the land of Egypt. Pharaoh quickly summoned Moses and Aaron and said, I've sinned against the Lord your God your God and against you. Now forgive my sin once more and pray to the Lord your God to take this deadly plague away from me. Moses then left Pharaoh and prayed to the Lord and the Lord changed the wind to a very strong west wind, which caught up the locusts and carried them into the Red Sea. Not a locust was left anywhere in Egypt, but the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart and he would not let the Israelites go. This is relentless, but what is the Lord doing? Is this about Pharaoh? No, it's about the Lord is hardening Pharaoh's heart. He's the one doing it. It is relentless. But he is making a point. Then the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand toward the sky so that the darkness spreads over Egypt, darkness, darkness that can be felt. So Moses stretched out his hand toward the sky and total darkness covered all Egypt for three days. No one could see anyone else or move about for three days. Yet all the Israelites had light in the places where they lived. Then Pharaoh summoned Moses and said, go worship the Lord. Even your women and children may go with you. Only leave your flocks and herds behind. But Moses said, you must allow us to have sacrifices and burnt offerings to present to the Lord our God. Our livestock too must go with us. Not a hoof is to be left behind. We have to use some of them in worshiping the Lord our God. And until we get there, we will not know what we are to use to worship the Lord. But the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart and he was not willing to let them go. Pharaoh said to Moses, get out of my sight. Make sure you do not appear before me again. The day you see my face, you will die. Just as you say, Moses replied, I will never appear before you again. Okay, so again, Pharaoh does not fear the Lord. He's looking at Moses, just like, you know, later on the Israelites are going to do the same thing. They're grumbling against Moses, and Moses is like, are you grumbling against me, or are you grumbling against the Lord? Like, what power do I have? That's the same thing. I speak a message. I have people on the channel, you know, grumbling against me, speaking all kinds of evil against me, accusing me of having a demon. Who are they arguing with? I mean, literally, I speak on the word in the videos, and... So they're, they can't be arguing with me. They're arguing against the word. Who is the word? Who became flesh and tabernacled among us? The word became flesh and tabernacled among us. They're arguing against God. It's not my authority on which I speak. Same thing with Pharaoh. Same thing with the Israelites when they're grumbling against Moses. Now the Lord had said to Moses, I will bring one more plague on Pharaoh and on Egypt. After that, he will let you go from there. And when he does, he will drive you out completely. Tell the people and the men and women alike, all to ask their neighbors for articles of silver and gold. Okay, so he's preparing them ahead of time, just as he did in the very beginning of the story, that they are going to plunder. Remember, he said that at the very beginning, they're going to plunder the Egyptians. And so the Lord made the Egyptians favorably disposed toward the people, and Moses himself was highly regarded in Egypt by Pharaoh's officials and by the people. So Moses said, this is what the Lord says, about midnight, I will go throughout Egypt. Every firstborn son in Egypt will die. From the firstborn son of Pharaoh who sits on the throne to the firstborn son of the female slave who is at her hand mill, and all the firstborn of the cattle as well. There will be loud wailing throughout Egypt, worse than there has ever been or will ever be again. But among the Israelites, not a dog will bark at any person or animal. 
Then you will know that the Lord makes a distinction between Egypt and Israel. All these officials of yours will come to me, bowing down before me and saying, Go, you and all the people who follow you. After that, I will leave. Then Moses, hot with anger, left Pharaoh. The Lord had said to Moses, Pharaoh will refuse to listen to you so that my wonders may be multiplied in Egypt. Moses and Aaron performed all these wonders before Pharaoh, but the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart and he would not let the Israelites go out of his country. By the way, where's Nefertiti here? Did you ever see <laughs> Did you ever see uh, the Ten Commandments? You remember Nefertiti? She was the one that was like, uh, you know, married. She Apparently she was with Moses first and then she was with Pharaoh. There was this whole kind of love triangle thing going on. Where's she? Do you see the additions to the scroll? Like that stuff gets up in your head and then you have a narrative and then you have an image and then you have, you know what I'm saying? Like that's not good stuff. And, and I'm sure you probably made the same mistake I did. You know, when I, when I went from being pagan to uh, being called to Christ, I thought, okay, well, I'll just repa- replace all my pagan things with, um, you know, what I thought were religious things. Like I'll watch religious movies. Well, guess what? That's pagan. He doesn't want me occupied by movies. He wants me occupied with him. If I want to know about him, I need to read his word and I need to relate with his spirit. But can you see, you know, after watching a movie like that, like you start to get characters and images and, you know, even tones, you start to get that in your heart, right? But see, Moses was, for all intents and purposes, seemed to be a pretty simple man who wasn't very eloquent, not like the Charlton Heston type. And when you're distracted with all of those other details in the movie, you're not really rending your heart to like the things that God wants you to pay attention to, the things that he wants you to understand. Not only that, but there are distortions and additions to the scroll and evolutions of the characters, right? So these are something to take into consideration. If you're still watching movies like that, I strongly encourage you to pray about that. I can't remember if I read this last part, so let me read it again. Uh, Verse 9. The Lord had said to Moses, Pharaoh will will refuse to listen to you so that my wonders may be multiplied in Egypt. Moses and Aaron performed all these wonders before Pharaoh, but the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart and he would not let the Israelites go out of his country. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron in Egypt, this month is to be for you the first month, the first month of your year. Tell the whole community of Israel on the 10th day of this month, each man is to take a lamb for his family, one for each household. If any household is too small for the whole lamb, they must share with one of their nearest neighbor, having taken into account the number of people there are. You are to determine the amount of lamb needed in accordance with what each person will eat. The animal you choose must be year-old males without defect, and you may take them from the sheep or the goats. Take care of them until the 14th day of the month when all the members of the community of Israel must slaughter them at twilight. Then they are to take some of the blood and put it on the sides and tops of the door frames of the houses where they eat the lambs. That same night, they are to eat the meat roasted over the fire along with bitter herbs and made and bread made without yeast. Do not eat the meat raw or boiled in water, but roasted over a fire with the head, legs, and internal organs. Do not leave any of it till morning. If some of it, uh, if some is left till morning, you must burn it. This is how you are to eat it, with your cloak tucked into your belt, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand. Eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. Why are they eating it in haste? Because they're going to be driven out that night. I was having a conversation with someone about this the other day, and they they said, oh, they couldn't have left that night because if they had left that night, they would have died. No, that's not true. The destroying angel came through, killed everyone, and then Pharaoh drove them out that night. That's why they were told... Eat it with your cloak tucked into your belt, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand. Eat it in haste. All right. On that same night, I will pass through Egypt and strike down every firstborn of both people and animals, and I will bring judgment on all the gods of Egypt. I am the Lord. The blood will be a sign for you in the houses where you are, and you, when you, I see the blood, I will pass over you. No destructive plague will touch you when I strike Egypt. This is a day you are to commemorate for the generations to come. You shall celebrate it as a festival to the Lord, a lasting ordinance. For seven days, you are to eat bread made without yeast. Okay, this is another thing that this person was saying. That this festival of Passover has nothing to do with the festival of unleavened bread, that they're two separate things. But here you are. This is to be a day you commemorate for the generations to come. You shall celebrate it as a festival to the Lord, a lasting ordinance. For seven days, you are to eat bread made without yeast. On the first day, remove the yeast from your houses 
For whoever eats anything with yeast in it from the first day through the seventh must be cut off from Israel. On the first day, hold a sacred assembly and on another, on another one, excuse me, and another one on the seventh day. Do no work at all on these days except to prepare food for everyone to eat. That is all you may do. He is talking about the festival of unleavened bread within the context of Passover. You see that again in Luke 22, verse 1, where it says, let's read it. And we're going to read it in a few different translations. Let's start with uh, KJV. Now the feast of unleavened bread drew nigh, which is called the Passover. Let's go to ESV. Now the feast of unleavened bread uh, unleavened dread, unleavened bread drew near, which is called the Passover. Let's go to NIV. Now the festival of unleavened bread called the Passover was approaching. Now let's go to OJB. This is the Orthodox Jewish Bible, so if you want to read it in Hebrew, here's Hebrew. And the Chag HaMatzot was approaching the fest, excuse me, the feast called Pesach, Passover. Okay, there shouldn't be any argument about this, about any, uh, I all I did was choose like the most popular um, translations that that, uh, that I look at. I, there was no rhyme or reason to why I chose them. The, the case is settled here. Festival of Unleavened Bread is also the Passover. There are different things happening on different nights. Yes, the Passover first night is going to be that first night when the lamb is slaughtered. And also, the next seven days, also called the Passover. And let me tell you why this, why I believe this is. Because there's a period we're living through right now. The seven-year period. Seven-day, two-year prophecy. In which those of us who have the seal, the Passover seal of the lamb, we're being passed over. Do you think that God might be representing the first day, representing Jesus, and the next seven days representing those who are being passed over? Uh, yeah, maybe. That's the fulfillment of the Passover. You got the first Passover. You got Jesus being sacrificed. You have the end, the very end, that it all pointed toward what Jesus did for us and those who will be passed over in the very end by the blood of the lamb. So let's read it again with that perspective. On that same night, I will pass through Egypt and strike down every firstborn of both people and animals, and I will bring judgment on all the gods of Egypt. I am the Lord. The blood will be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. No destructive plague will touch you when I strike Egypt. Same language that's being used in the trumpets. Revelation verse 9, the fifth angel sounded his trumpet and I saw a star that had fallen from the sky to the earth. The star was given the key to the shaft of the abyss. When he opened the abyss, smoke rose from it like the smoke from a gigantic furnace. The sun and sky were darkened by the smoke from the abyss. And out of the smoke, locusts came down on the earth and were given power like that of scorpions of the earth. They were told not to harm the grass of the earth or any plant or tree, but only those people who did not have the seal of God on their foreheads. So who's he passing over? Those who have the seal, the blood of the lamb. They were allowed to kill them, but only not allowed to kill them, but only to torture them for five months. And the agony they suffered was like that of the sting of a scorpion when it strikes. During those days, people will seek death, but, long, uh, but will not find it. They will long to die, but death will elude them. So do you see what's happening in the very end? That's the fulfillment or the third fulfillment. Celebrate the festival of unleavened bread because it was on that this very day that I brought your divisions out of Egypt. Celebrate this day as a lasting ordinance for the generations to come. In the first month, you are to eat bread made without yeast from the evening of the 14th day until the evening of the 21st day. For seven days, eat no, ye uh, no yeast is to be found in your houses. And anyone, whether foreigner or native born, who eats anything with yeast in it is to be cut off from the community of Israel. Eat nothing made without yeast. Wherever you live, you must eat unleavened bread. Okay, so we're given another reason why we're celebrating the Festival of Unleavened Bread. And it says right here, celebrate the Festival of Unleavened Bread because it was on this very day that I brought your divisions out of Egypt. Celebrate this day as a lasting ordinance for the generations to come. In the first month, you are to eat bread made without yeast from the evening of the 14th day until the evening of the 21st day. Okay, we already read that. Now let's go to uh, verse 21. Then Moses summoned all the elders of Israel and said to them, go at once and select the animals for your families and slaughter the Passover lamb. Take a bunch of hyssop, dip it into the blood in the basin and put some of the blood on the top and on both sides of the door frame. None of you shall go out of the door of your house until morning. When the Lord goes through the land to strike down the Egyptians, he will see the blood on the top and sides of the door frame and will pass over that doorway and he will not permit the destroyer to enter your house and strike you down. Okay, same thing happening in the trumpets. Obey these instructions as a lasting ordinance for you and your descendants. When you enter the land that the Lord will give you, as he promised, observe this ceremony. And when your children ask you, why does this, what does this ceremony mean to you? 
Then tell them it is the Passover sacrifice to the Lord who passed over the houses of the Israelites in Egypt and spared our homes when he struck down the Egyptians. Then the people bowed down and worshiped. The Israelites did just what the Lord commanded Moses and Aaron. At midnight, the Lord struck down all the firstborn in Egypt from the firstborn of Pharaoh who sat on the throne to the firstborn of the prisoner who was in the dungeon and the firstborn of all the livestock as well. Pharaoh and all his officials and all the Egyptians got up during the night and there was loud wailing in Egypt for there was not a house without someone dead. During the night, Pharaoh summoned Moses and Aaron and said, up. Okay, what does the word say? It says, during the night, Pharaoh summoned Moses and Aaron and said, up, leave my people, you and the Israelites, go worship the Lord as you have requested. Take your flocks and herds as you you have said and go and also bless me. Pharaoh has so much nerve, I mean, really, and also bless me. The Egyptians urged the people to hurry and leave the country, for otherwise they said we will all die. So the people took their dough before the yeast was added and carried it on their shoulders in kneading troughs wrapped in clothing. The Israelites did as Moses instructed and asked the Egyptians for articles of gold, silver and gold, and for clothing. The Lord had made the Egyptians favorably disposed toward the people, and they gave them what they asked for, so they plundered the Egyptians." The Israelites journeyed from Ramesses to Sikoth. There were about 600,000 men on foot besides women and children. Many other people went with them and also large droves of livestock, both flocks and herds, with the dough the Israelites had brought from Egypt and baked loaves of unleavened bread. The dough was without yeast because they had been driven out of Egypt and did not have time to prepare food for themselves. Okay, so dough is without yeast because they had gone quickly. They had gone quickly. Also, they had uh, the cloak tucked into the belt and the staff. It was like they were ready to go, right? Ready to go. They were going to be driven out that night. There should be no argument about that. This, the word is very clear. But as I said earlier, someone was telling me that this, they didn't leave that night. That's not true. They left that night. The Israelites journeyed from Ramesses to Sukkoth. There were about 600,000 men on foot. Besides women and children, many other people went up with them and also large droves of livestock, both flocks and herds. With the dough the Israelites had brought from Egypt, they baked loaves of unleavened bread. The dough was without yeast because they had been driven out of Egypt and did not have time to prepare food for themselves. Now, the length of time the Israelite people lived in Egypt was 430 years. At the end of the 430 years to the very day, all the Lord's divisions left Egypt because the Lord kept vigil that night to bring them out of Egypt On this night, all the Israelites are to keep vigil to honor the Lord for the generations to come. What is keep vigil? To keep watch. So that's what we do. We keep watch on that night for all the generations to come. Now we just got to figure out what night that is, don't we? Since uh, the Antichrist has messed with God's calendar, but God has his ability to reveal. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron, these are the regulations for the Passover meal. No foreigner may eat it. Any slave you have bought may eat it after you have circumcised him. But a temporary resident or a hired worker may not eat it. Okay, so someone asked me the other night uh, or the other day, I was speaking with them and they said that when they went to a counterfeit church that they would say no one could eat the Passover meal unless they had been baptized. What's the instruction right here? The Lord said to Moses and Aaron, these are the regulations for the Passover meal. No foreigner may eat it. A foreigner is described, is defined as someone who's not circumcised in heart. So... I mean, in terms of someone eating the meal, like you should be hanging out with people with whom you're in agreement, first of all. Many people have tried to eat the Passover meal who are not circumcised in heart. I mean, let's be real. But as far as you preparing the meal in your house, you should not be engaging in that meal like as though you're just inviting people over and hosting a meal. In terms of eating the Passover meal, you should only invite people with whom you are in agreement, with whom you know that they are circumcised in heart. It's not like, hey, I'm cooking lamb, come on over. Let's party. That's, that's not what we're doing here. Nor is that what you should ever be doing. But the, the point is, no one's going to partake of the Passover lamb of God who has not been circumcised in heart. And so that means you need to be living this out. And baptism is part of it. Does that mean baptism in a counterfeit church? No, I don't consider that to be baptism. Baptism is a baptism of repentance. And if you don't have anyone to baptize you, I am sure that God is able to baptize you. But you need to engage in repentance. So of the two times that I've been baptized in counterfeit churches, two different 
counterfeit churches one, when I was a child as Mormon and when I was an adult in a counterfeit church, Christian church. God had me in a process of repentance for at least, at least a year, actually. And then he walked me through a process of baptism in my bathtub. It took a year for him to put that on my heart. And it wasn't even something I'd been thinking about. It was something that he walked me through. So whatever it is, whatever motions we've gone through in our lives in counterfeit Christianity are meaningless. They're, they're, they don't mean anything unless they've been walked through with God. You need to go take that up with him. There's no one here. Who would baptize me, guys? John the Baptist had the power to baptize people. The apostles had the power to baptize people. They had an anointing to baptize. Who would, who would baptize me? Do you see what I'm saying? Who's left? Who has the anointing to baptize? Take it up with God. Do yourself a favor and take it up with God. Ask him what baptism means to him. You don't need to blow up pool. You don't need a priest in a clown costume. You don't need any of that. Those things are not important to God. Repentance, return. That's what's important to God. So the word says, no foreigner may eat it. Any slave you have bought may eat it after you have circumcised him, but a temporary resident or a hired worker may not eat it. If you care about the commands of God, then you should be following this command. But I was talking with someone on the phone the other day and they said, well, don't get upset because I've eaten uh, Passover with someone who wasn't baptized or whatever it was that they said. And I was like, why would, I mean, why are you, you shouldn't be concerned about whether I get upset. You should be concerned about whether you're obeying God. That's, that's the bottom line. Take it up with him. It must be eaten inside the house. Take none of the meat outside of the house. Do not break any of the bones. The whole is the whole community of Israel must celebrate it. And remember that none of the bones were broken on Jesus. And you can't take, you can't take Jesus outside of the house and just start giving him away to, you know, people who prostitute themselves to the world. Don't take him out of the house. He is only for the community of Israel who are circumcised in heart. A foreigner residing among you who wants to celebrate the Lord's Passover must have all the males in his household circumcised. Then they may take part like one born in the land. No uncircumcised male may eat it. Do you hear like the, do you hear the theme here? You don't take Jesus and go make him palatable for everybody else. You, if someone wants to participate in this, then you make them palatable for Jesus. You bring them as an acceptable offering to him, not the other way around. The same law applies to both the native born and the foreigner residing among you. All the Israelites did just what the Lord had commanded Moses and Aaron. And on that very day, the Lord brought the Israelites out of Egypt by their divisions. Okay, I'm going to split this up. And I know that I didn't get to... uh, You know, the part in Hebrews 11, verse 29, where it says, by faith, the people passed through the Red Sea as on dry land. But when the Egyptians tried to do this, so they were drowned. But this is a long video. So I'm going to split it up and I'll go ahead and read that part of it in the next video. I hope you're enjoying these little uh, videos on stories of faith. I, I am. See you in the next video.